introducing Dr. Philip Castle. Dr. Castle received his PhD in biophysics from Johns Hopkins University, and then he went on to get a master's in public health, also from Hopkins. He joined the National Cancer Institute as a cancer prevention fellow, and he rose to become a tenured senior investigator at the National Cancer Institute. In 2011, he left NCI to become the chief scientific officer and executive director of the American Society for Clinical Pathology. He holds visiting professor appointments at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and at the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences and Peking Union Medical College. In 2012, he became the co-founder and co-director of the Global Cancer Initiative. So he is here today to speak to us about global cancer. And Phil, welcome you. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about cervical cancer as a model or, or the beachhead for delivering uh, global cancer care. Um, as I will outline, we've made tremendous progress in the uh, development of new tools for cervical cancer prevention. And really the challenge going forward is how do we deliver those tools? And in the process of delivering those tools, it creates an opportunity or a conduit for other cancer care. For full disclosure, I've listed my uh, disclosures in um, potential conflicts of interest. I'm not going to, uh, you can read through those as well as I can. Uh, just, uh, you know, I really want you to understand, you know, where, where if any, conflicts do exist. So I'm going to cover four topics today. I want to give you a quick overview of the uh, uh, global perspective on cervical cancer. Uh, then go to natural history of HPV because if you don't understand the disease, it's hard to prevent it and, and, and to do it in an effective and cost-effective manner. Talk a little <coughs> bit about new tools and then about half of the talk is going to be uh, looking at how we make cervical cancer prevention available. And then beyond that, how do we use that to start to drive the conversation about global cancer health? <clears throat> so, of course, this all, the whole conversation started with the development of pap smear. George Papanicolaou in the mid-20th century discovered that you could look at cells on glass and see abnormalities. And for the most part, it's been very successful in places where, where it's been implemented. So here's uh, the cancer incidence rates in four Nordic countries. And you can see that there have been dramatic <clears throat> declines in the cervical cancer incidence and mortality uh, in those places. And as a consequence, it's actually created one of the greatest cancer health disparity, and in absolute terms, the biggest cancer health disparity in the world, which is um, the places that have effectively implemented uh, cancer screening programs based on a pap smear have had rates go down 75, 80, 90 percent. But then there's the rest of the world, fifth, five, sixths of the world, that have not been able to implement this in any um, uh, comprehensive way. And so in places like Latin America and Africa and uh, many places in Asia, uh, the rates have gone unchecked, unchanged, and uh, they have been fundamentally unable to implement a PAP program. So essentially what you have is an order of magnitude difference between the haves and the have-nots. And even in our own country, we have some significant problems in isolated populations where women don't have access um, or that we, you know, there are uh, social barriers or uh, geographical barriers related to screening. So we have second world rates of um, Cancer, cervical cancer mortalities, for example, uh, along uh, the uh, eastern seaboard here, uh, along the, in the Mississippi Delta, Central Valley in, in, uh, in California. Uh, this doesn't show up well here because of misclassification of the population, but uh, along the U.S.-Mexican border, we have migrant populations that have high rates and so forth. <coughs> Uh, not shown on here, if we went out to the U.S. Pacific territories, you would see very high rates because 
they don't get services from the United States, and the WHO sees them as part of the United States. So, you know, they have these isolated populations that are, you know, 10,000 miles away from anything, and they basically don't get any services. And so, cervical cancer really is a metric as a, a, of access to care, as uh, Harold Freeman has outlined throughout his career. So let me, let's bring it down to the basics here because I think, as I said before, you have to understand the disease to know how to use the tools effectively. This is the old model of cervical cancer and the pathologist would basically look at this, the thickness of this transformed layer and, and there are lots of different terms. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid a lot of these terms, although sometimes it's not quite possible, but essentially they were looking at this thickness and then obviously when it went through the, um, the basal layer it was invasive cancer. So to orient you, this is the lumen of the cervix where the babies come out, if you will, um, and this is the, is the uh, basal layer where invasion occurs. Because we discovered human papillomavirus as the necessary cause, of cervical cancer, and I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that, the, this entire model has changed. And there are really four key steps. And what I've shown you here is the microscopic and macroscopic um, representations of each of those stages, but it really comes down to four key steps. There's a normal cervix, there's an HPV-infected cervix, and HPV is a sexually transmitted infection. Mostly what happens is this goes away, and in fact, really, in a sexually active population, anybody who's been sexually active, it's probably not, if you've been exposed, it's how many times you've exposed. So the CDC says 80%. I think that that's a vast underestimate. Um, and we can talk about that later. It's not really um, uh, valuable for this uh, particular conversation, but just to basically know that it's a universal exposure, it really should almost be seen as a commensal Unfortunately, in rare, on a per event basis, some women don't clear the infection. They develop persistent infection, and then their risk really goes up to have precancer and cancer. And the goal of screening in cervix is not to find early cancer, it's really to find precancer and detect it and treat it in a timely fashion. So, um, as I said, these are the representations. I mean, for example, here, this is a classic um, pap smear with a cytosis. You see that clearing around that. All that ever was was HPV production. So what, what the pathologist saw as coilocytosis or abnormality was just the virus being made. And if we had an EM picture of this, we'd see this uh, almost crystal array of virus being packaged and being ready to be released out into the lumen. Um, I put this up particularly for a global health group because I want you to recognize that HPV is an equal opportunity killer. There's nothing special about the women, I was talking to Dr. Bartlett about Tanzania, there's nothing special about the women in Mississippi, and there's nothing special about the women in Durham, North Carolina. Really the key is, did you get HPV, did you clear it, and, and or not clear it, and do you have access to services? That's all it is. So when, uh, this is a seminal study by the Barcelona group, and basically, and here I put this line represents the combined 16 and 18, which are the two types that are targeted by the vaccine. But essentially, wherever you go in the world, you see approximately <coughs> the same distribution of types with a little bit of play, which probably has more to do with sampling differences than anything else, um, that the same types cause cervical cancer everywhere in the world. We don't really need to study it anymore about what types cause cancer. And we see these proposals for Oh, what types cause cancer in Guatemala or in, you know, in Argentina? It's the same types, more or less. Um, and that's a real opportunity because that means the tools that we develop for one place in the world will work essentially in another place in the world. We don't have to design specific tools for specific areas. These tools will work everywhere in the world. The key step in the natural history is this split the infections that go away versus the infections that don't. And what, uh, this is data from Guanacaste, Costa Rica, which I, I worked with the group there for many years. And what this graph shows is the clearance of HPV over uh, a seven-month period of time modeled um, as such. So 
on time zero, there was a group of women who walked in with HPV. And then we said, what happened to the infection? They could clear infection, which is shown in the, in the greenish blue. They could uh, continue to have persistent infection, or as shown in the red on top, they could develop uh, precancerous lesions. So what you can see is that HP, even prevalently detected HPV goes away very, very quickly. Within six months, more than 50% of it goes away, and we see this in multiple populations. Um, then by 12 months, we see 70% of it gone. So within 12 months, most of it's cleared, and by two years, we see around 90%. However, those women that don't clear the infection, we already start to see some of those women having detectable precancerous lesions. So the decision process of what happens to that infection happens very quickly. As I'll show you in the next slide, even one year HPV persistence represents a significant risk to women for developing precancer and cancer. So here I took the same kind of analysis, but I turned it on its side and I said, okay, at time zero, we're gonna say these women have one year persistent infection. So what happens subsequent to that one year persistent infection? So if you have persistent HPV-16, you have a 35%, one in three chance of having a precancerous lesion in the next five years. I mean, if you think about medical practice, how many things that we do in medical practice can tell you one out of three women have, you are gonna get precancer or some significant clinical disease. It's a pretty strong predictor. And even persistent 18 is 25%. And even women who just had positive positive, which was a proxy for per, a persistent of other types, had about a 20% risk. These are potent risk factors when they don't clear. Now, fortunately, as I said, most of the time it goes away. But how do you, you know, there's this subset, and we don't know, we don't know immunologically or host response why those <coughs> small fraction of women don't clear it. But when they don't, they're at a significant risk. Um, I'm not showing you all the data here that goes into a, a model like this, but essentially what you see is that the infections follow this path no matter what age they get. There's a, you get the infection and then when you look at populations, of course, you see peak prevalence of HPV in young women when they become sexually active and also in men. Uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, men don't suffer the same degree of consequences of HPV infection. You get this rapid clearance phase, and you get the earliest precancers. Now, if you moved forward 20 years and you found those precancers again and they weren't treated, you would have precancers that have significant um, potential for invasive cancer. So, essentially, the earliest precancer, like what we find in the United States, is this small, full thickness lesion that has very little invasive potential. And then it grows out and it develops uh, at a molecular level, and we don't know the determinants of that, but it develops the ability to become invasive. So when you look at populations, you see the peak prevalence of HPV about five years, three to about three years after sexual debut. You get a big peak of HPV. Then about five to ten years after that um, median age of sexual debut, you see screen detected precancer if you have screening. And then 25 years you see from that median age you see cancer. And it's the same everywhere in the world. The difference in some populations is when do they start having sex. So in a, we tend to see you know, that, that curve shift in Muslim countries where people start having sex later. And then you know, there's stories of populations that start earlier and then you get that cancer shift to a younger age. The other unique thing about cervical cancer is not a cancer in, in women, of, of older women, it's a cancer of women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. So it has a significant societal impact. Women who are raising families who are working who are getting this cancer. So <coughs> beyond the fact that it's the second most common cancer worldwide is that societal impact um, um, because of the age at which it strikes. So, unlike pretty much any other cancer, having the causal factors <coughs> led to really a revolution in technologies for prevention of cervical cancer. And I'm gonna present a little of the evidence of how well these things really work. Um, and there are always caveats. Tools can be used well, and tools can be used poorly. And we know, like in the United States, for example, there's lots of over-screening, 
people who don't need to be vaccinated are getting vaccinated and, and so forth. Um, we don't have that luxury on a global uh, level because there's just not enough money to be wasting money. So we have to be much more thoughtful about how we apply these tools. Um, we'd all like to sign up and buy our ounce of prevention, but unfortunately we actually have to go out and do it. I'm going to only talk a little bit about vaccines because to me the vaccines are sort of um, the exception to the rule. Mostly what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do screening, we're going to have to find, make early diagnosis of cancer in most places in the world. <clears throat> but I do want to say a little something about vaccines and only because I want to say that there's an appropriate way to use vaccines and there's an inappropriate way to use vaccines. So here are two uh, data from two trials here. And I've stratified or I've shown the, uh, two different analyses. In the blue is the HPV naive population. So there was no evidence that they'd already been exposed to HPV. And in the red was there was some evidence in the ITT, there was some evidence that they had been exposed to HPV prior to their getting the vaccine. And in both of these trials, what you can see is that in the naive population, it doesn't matter what age you are. You get full benefit. But in the uh, all comers, um, what you see is a, a significant decline in the benefit of the vaccine by age. And you see it in two very different populations. And the reason for that is shown in the next slide, I think, I hope, there we go, is that the vaccine is purely a prophylactic vaccine. It does not treat the pre-existing condition or infection. So, if you give women who already have infection a, uh, um, um, a vaccine and you look at the clearance rates of 16 at 6 months and 12 months, you can see that it didn't matter whether they got the HPV vaccine or placebo against 18. Even if you required all three doses in a community trial, <coughs> there was no difference in the clearance rates of those that got the HPV vaccine versus a Hep A placebo. The point being that, again, the vaccine is prophylactic and what you see when you see those age declines in efficacy is that they've already been exposed, they're not benefiting. So really the benefit of HPV vaccine is to give it before they ever get exposed. So the notion like here where we have um, you know, women can get vaccinated up to the age of 26. It's just, it's just wrong from a cost effectiveness standpoint because you're really getting so much less benefit than if you vaccinate young girls before they become sexually active. I mean, <clears throat> if, it, if people had to pay out of pocket, they would of course make the rational decision, but because it goes off into insurance land, okay, we tend to do really kind of stupid stuff, but we can't do that internationally. We can't do it globally. We have to get the maximum benefit from everything that we do. So it really makes sense to vaccinate. It's a very effective, very safe vaccine, but really has no business in uh, being given to women, uh, let's say 18 and older. And in my opinion, really should be limited to 10 to 13 or something like that. So now I'm gonna switch to screening and, and secondary prevention because that has a much bigger overlap with sort of global cancer care. But I wanted to, to, to kind of put in your mind that there's a rational way to do things and that applies to everything that we do in cancer health. So, as a, you know, we talked about pap smears as being the standard. Uh, and over the last 20 years, HPV testing, molecular HPV testing has uh, um, been developed and validated. And what I want to show you here is the evidence that it's a much more sensitive tool and, and as I'll explain later, makes it a very good screening tool. It's not a great diagnostic and it's a good screening tool in that high sensitivity means great negative predictive value and negative predictive value really allows you to tell women to go home, you're safe. And that's what a screening tool should do. So. These are paired studies. Uh, this uh, the, in the white was a compilation that uh, my friend Jack Kuzik put together at uh, International Journal of Cancer, looking at these Western countries paired uh, cytology and HPV testing. And then I've overlaid uh, a series of uh, recent publications to give you a sense again that the story continues to be the same over and over and over. Uh, and 
quite remarkably consistent. So when you look at the performance, the sensitivity for precancer and cancer by pap smears, you see lots of variability and overall average around 50%. That means if 20 women on a given day walk into the door with a precancerous lesion, you're sending 10 of them home saying you're negative, you're safe. <clears throat> and that underlies why we had PAP screen programs the way we do, which is you have to do them over and over and over to find the disease. Fortunately, in the United States, we could get women, or in, the, in Western countries, we could get women back over and over and over. And the disease progresses slowly enough that you'd find it and treat it before you get uh, invasive cancer. The green here I want to highlight, so uh, Katerina Ferrecci is a friend of mine from Chile and she had come to the NCI when I was there and you know, we talked her into doing a trial and she said, you know, Chile's got the, got the best you know, PATH program in South America. I said, okay, let's put it to the test. So she just published this paper also in International Journal of Cancer in which their PAP program, the premier program in South America, was 25% sensitive. Now let's look at HPV. What you can see here is not only is it a very consistent, but very consistent high sensitivity around 95%, over and over and over and over and over. Um, that's a pretty remarkable tool, but it also goes to st start to think globally, like how do we actually use this? And this is the kind of thing where, yes, you might have to pay more to do it, but what you're paying for is this kind of consistent quality that could be delivered anywhere in the world. And I'll show you some of the new tools that are being developed to kind of make this happen. So one of the arguments could be that you're finding a lot of irrelevant precancer and, and like all cancers we have indolent disease things that really don't need to be treated but we treat them because of a safe margin of safety but what you can see in a couple of the clinical trials here is that when you looked at the second round of screening after intervening on HPV versus PAP in the first round of screening you see a cancer reduction a 75 percent cancer reduction which says that some of those precancerous lesions that were found and treated early actually had invasive potential. They were clinically important. They weren't just lookalikes that might have been ignored otherwise and, and wouldn't have benefited the population. And this is the kind of data that really lends itself to saying, okay, this is going to make a difference if we can make it available. <coughs> um, but it, I'm talking a lot of pro-HPV here and I want to be clear that there is no free lunch. You can't get something for nothing. Well, you guys can because you got pizza back there, but in general you have to pay for uh, added sensitivity and what happens with HPV is that uh, it is less sensitive. HPV does not differentiate between the benign infection that's unrelated to disease and the HPV infection that's causing a precancerous lesion. So, Coming back to my point, HPV is very good, and I'll show you some additional slides. Actually, let me show you the next slide. So HPV finds more disease, but because more of the population tests positive, it actually has a poorer positive predictive value. Here I'm using cumulative incidence of CIN3+, plus in, our Kaiser, in a Portland Kaiser study. So even though more disease was found in the HPV arm, the positive predictive value of PAP was much higher. What's really remarkable about this is that you, and this slide and the next slide, is you'll see how these two different tools work differently. So the PAP finds disease right away, but doesn't really predict much after a year or two, which is again why we have to keep doing PAPs over and over. But look at this. HPV, one time <coughs> test, and not even an optimized test, this was not even uh, using standard, of, standard collections that would be used now, um, was still predicting women getting precancer and cancer 18 years later. Uh, to me, I still get blown away when I think about that. That we can pick out a woman, at least she's at an elevated risk 18 years later. Now most of the women who are positive here have cleared their infection. I'm not saying that they're all at risk, but I'm saying we're still, we can predict risk 18 years later. So, you know, coming back to the screening versus diagnostic, the power of HPV is not its pop, the positive test, although it is more sensitive, 
the power of HPV is that if you test negative, you're very, very safe and you can extend screening intervals. And in fact, that's what led to changing the US guidelines to every five years with HPV and PAP co-testing. And these are the kind of data that have supported that. So let me walk you through this. So this is, again, the cumulative incidence of CIN3. And this is the time. And this is data from Europe that was combined over several cohort studies. Look at the risk. If you have a negative PAP at time zero, you can see that the risk goes up pretty substantially and pretty quickly. It doesn't provide that much reassurance. Look at HPV alone. In fact, it's so much greater that <coughs> um, oops, that you know essentially you can draw a line across here. And you say if if 12 month safety is acceptable for a PAP every year, that means that every five years or four or five years is acceptable by HPV. Very simple risk based approach, which is how we're moving in the United States. Uh, I was at a guidelines meeting. Uh, couple months ago, and the entire conversation was about risk-based management. I was, I mean, it was so rational, we got done a half a day early. There was nothing to fight about. Um, and we need to do more of that in breast cancer and prostate and so forth. So I'd like to take the last 15 or 20 minutes and now talk about how we make this available. So all this is great, and all the stuff is starting to be seen in the United States and Europe, but as we pointed out, really the bulk of the 85 to 90 percent of the cancers are happening in places that don't have any of this stuff. And so one of my goals in the last part of my career is how do I make sure that they get delivered? <coughs> so Mark Schiffman, who was my mentor at the NCI, and I wrote this article uh, seven years ago, this commentary, and said, now that we know so much about the natural history, what's the right actions? Well, how do we move forward with this? Um, how do we use this in a really smart way? So traditionally, we did pap smears, and we did them over and over and over for the reasons that I explained to you. And it was completely rational at the time, because we didn't know about HPV. But now, we've actually got some pretty cool tools, as I will show you. And we can move away from that model, and we can vaccinate young women. And now that Gavi has listed HPV vaccination, as one of its vaccines, now we got to get we got to get the countries to do it. We can do a couple screens in a lifetime based on HPV because that we can extend the interval safely and focus our attention, our clinical attention, on the positives. So rather than continuing to screen the whole population over and over, we send a whole bunch of women home and we focus down on the positives and we say we got to find the disease or we do simplified programs to screen and treat. We'll talk more about that. And if you have the money for greater reassurance, maybe you add in a couple additional screens. It's all about choice and economics at that point. If we, um, if we continue to do nothing different, and you look at the global CAN numbers and you simply assume a linear growth here, you will see that literally tens of millions of women are going to get cervical cancer over the next 50 years and 25 million at least will die from it. And if you simply want to wait for vaccines to solve the problem, unfortunately, even if we could implement them now based on that natural history that it takes 25 years from the infection to cancer, you know, at least half of those cases will occur while you're waiting for vaccines, even if we could put vaccines in the air and the water right now put them everywhere in the world immediately, we would still have this happening. So we can't, we can't just let vaccines solve the problem. But more importantly, there's it not only there's an opportunity because there's lots of other stuff that needs to be done that we use cervix as a, as a driver to, to build up capacity for other cancers, for non-communicable diseases, and even infectious diseases, which there's been a fair amount of focus on, but Clearly, lots of people in the world get HIV, TB, and malaria. So in order to prevent those disease and manage those, you actually have to have medical infrastructure and public health infrastructure. Um, some of the first work actually didn't use HPV. It used visual inspection. Um, I think I have sort of mixed feelings about visual inspection as a subjective test. I'm not sure that it works as well as 
people say it does, but it is a tool, and we'll talk about the menu of options. Uh, this is from the IARC group showing that uh, a VIA, or visual inspection after acetic acid, which in which you just look at the cervix with acetic acid, and if you see a white lesion, you treat it in some way. It does have impact on uh, incidence of cancer. But the same group then did a study where they, it was a forearm study, they did, um, you know, they sent one, one quarter of the population to standard of care, said go get whatever services you're going to get. One group to a PAP-based program, one group to a visual inspection-based program, and one to an HPV, and they had one-time screening, and then they did an eight-year follow-up. So in the blue is uh, the cancer incidence following a negative test, that reassurance that we were talking about earlier. <coughs> And what you can see is that, again, HPV provides just a much greater reassurance. One negative test is just so much better than anything we can do with a subjective negative test. But importantly, that among the positives, where they sent the positives to colposcopy and they got diagnosed and they got treated according to standard of care, we see one-time HPV testing reduced the risk by 50% compared to the other uh, interventions in the control arm. One time, 50% reduction in mortality. Not in incidence, in mortality. Now this was a, this was a US FDA approved test that's probably not gonna be available enough, so part of my work over the last few years is to start working with groups that are developing lower cost tests. But this is a proof of principle that it could work. And in fact, really, the, the global conversation about laboratory tests have to be, how do we make them available? Can we create a Gavi-like organization, which is one of my dreams, to deliver diagnostic tests? We did it with vaccines. Why can't we do it with diagnostic tests? Why do we even need a new test when we have one that can reduce mortality by 50% within eight years? It's at least worth the conversation. It's worth sort of talking these things out. Um, There are other approaches to the traditional three-step intervention approach where you screen, you send the colposcopy for diagnosis, and you treat. Uh, this was a study in South America, uh, South Africa with Lynette Denny, a, a colleague of mine, and here you see cumulative incidence of precancer and cancer. The control arm was simply a six-month delay before they started to do uh, standard of care follow-up. Whereas these populations, there was an intervention at time zero. Here was the VIA, so you can see the v, a VIA based screen and treat. If you're positive and you don't have contraindications for cryo, you cryo. You don't do any diagnosis, it's just screen, treat, screen, treat. Um, so a VIA based program reduced the risk by 50%, but an HPV based approach re reduced another 50%. So very simplified program. Simple, you know, rel you know, if you could do a simple HPV test and you can treat any community health worker to look at the cervix, decide whether they're eligible for cryo and have them do the cryo. You don't need doctors for most of this. What you need doctors for in these places is to deal with the cancers and maybe to do the treatment of the precancer, although that's, that's subject to discussion. But you want to move the simple, the, the basic public health procedures as far down in the health infrastructure as you can because there are not enough doctors. If you tie doctors up with collecting PAP samples, oh my God, okay, you shut down the entire system. There's no business having doctors collect PAP smears. I mean, we can train everybody in this room to collect PAP smears. It's not rocket surgery. Um, so how do we start to make this stuff available? So in uh, the mid um, 2000s, um, I served on a technical advisory panel with PATH, um, which is the Program for Appropriate Technology in Health, that had gotten money from Bill and Melinda Gates to sponsor some companies developing lower cost tests. And so the first one that got developed is Care HPV. And you can see this is a very, this is not, you know, here's your pipette. So this is a very small footprint with a, with a very simple menu driven, and there's also a color-coded chart that tells the technician to do it. We've had people in Nigeria do it, in China do it, I mean, at you know, basically high school level education, no, you know, no, no lab training per se. Um, so that's one technology that we've been evaluating. Another one, which I'll show you in the next slide, was sort of taking advantage of the biology. So cervix is a great 
I mean, you could teach a whole course on cervix because it has great cancer biology, great cancer <coughs> epidemiology, and clinical epidemiology. So we started, uh, some of the groups have started to take advantage of the fact that we knew enough about the biology that we knew the gene expression of the virus shifts in precancer. So normally, HPV infection, here is CIN1 is HPV infection, the gene program is tied to the host differentiation, epithelial differentiation. So down in the basal layer, you have sort of low levels of E7 and E6, and then it shifts in order to make virus. And that's all that it's supposed to do. For reasons that we don't understand, there, when you go to a precancerous lesion, there's an overexpression of E7 and E6, as shown here. And so we wanted to, uh, with uh, a company, we wanted to see whether there could be a diagnostic that could take advantage of this as more of a diagnostically specific, you know, you have precancer. So uh, this company, Arborvita Corporation, made um, a diagnostic. It's basically, uh, it's a lateral flow strip uh, with, uh, in which they've uh, put on the uh, detections or the capture system and there's an dete uh, antibody detection system. It's very simple. It's even simpler than CARE-HPV. There's no readout. It's a, it's a visual readout. Um, there's a little centrifuge and a little mixer and that's it. So it's even another level of simplicity. So we've been doing this study in China, actually looking at all these and I don't want to go through all of this data. But, so here's the CARE HPV, and you can see that in our hands it was very sensitive and pretty sensitive even with a self-collected sample. And the E6 test, although not as sensitive, in part because it's only detecting three types at the moment rather than about 13 for all cervical cancer. But look at these positive predictive values, 47%, 41%. We've never seen anything like this. So we have things that are good screening tools now. We have good things that are more diagnostically accurate that might be useful in HIV populations where you have lots of HPV and the HPV test might not be useful. <coughs> and these are tests that are meant to be a few dollars. So we keep pushing, you know, the more that we can push down, the more that we can make these tools available. And because they're laboratory tests, they're not subjective, they're objective measures of risk. We think that they will certainly complement current programs and may replace uh, some programs. <coughs> Cell collection is a really important tool because uh, as some of you who have worked internationally know, if we brought all women in for a screening program, we would shut down the few clinics that there are available. So the more that we can move stuff even outside the clinic and have women self-collect um, and, and get the sample back, the better off we're going to be in terms of preserving the infrastructure to manage the really bad cases or even just manage the HPV positive women. So you can see here that in this uh, uh, pooled analysis from China that the uh, self-collection for detection of CIN3 had very high sensitivity, not as good as a clinician detected, uh, not as good as a clinician collected sample. But remember, we're talking going from 0% screening sensitivity to 85%. And that's a big difference. Um, and even if it, this was clinic-based, so even if you did bring them to the clinic, but you didn't have to use the doctor and you didn't have to use the speculum, you'd save a lot of resources on screening. Um, but this stuff also applies to low re lower resource settings in the United States. And when we went to Mississippi Delta and we asked women what they would do, whether they would self-collect or, or do a pap smear, twice as many women picked self-collection over a pap, getting a free pap, and twice as many women completed their intervention compared to getting the free pap. So there's actually a fourfold difference in this pilot study of completion of self-collection. So we're going to follow up on that to see if it really um, at a much larger scale really uh, um, could improve uh, screening in these low uh, poor access populations. I don't want you to digest this. Um, I just want to give you a flavor that we really have this menu of options now. And it's not, I mean I have my personal opinion about what works and doesn't work, but it doesn't matter what my opinion is, okay? The point is that a country who's committed to cervical cancer prevention needs to look at this and make an informed decision about what to do. And then we need to help them implement it. So you can piece this together any way you want and combine these things. 
The point is the country has to understand what the commitments are, financial commitments, resource commitments, and commit to doing it. Much more important than the particular technology that they choose. Coverage is very important. And the last part of the talk, you know, of course, I got thinking about this and I keep sort of relearning and learning new things as I think about it. And the screening part is actually the easy part. It's all the stuff around the screening that's really hard, okay? You have to, you know, this is, and this is not a comprehensive list, but you have to think about how patients are going to get to the, to the clinic or, you know, how you're going to get to the patients and health records and monitoring and recruitment and, you know, specimen transport if you're going to do self-collection. And, of course, if you go into a place that's never been screened, you're going to find a lot of cancers. And so what are you going to do with those cancers and palliative care? And, it's an overwhelming task, but it doesn't mean it's not a doable task. And I think what the opportunity is, of course, many of these things that I'm talking about will translate into other healthcare delivery. So what, you're, what I started off by saying using cervix is that if you could get people interested in cervical cancer, if, they really, if that was on the radar, then that would be cervical cancer. But the point being that you can start building the capacity for health services delivery across the spectrum of disease. One of the issues um, in doing any cancer health delivery is pathology. So almost very little of oncology or cancer prevention, uh, control, and care happens without a pathologist. And this is uh, some work that I contributed to. I'm not authoring it, but I think this is going to be in press soon or published soon, in which we tried to figure out how many pathologists were in sub-Saharan Africa by country. And here's sort of the, the <coughs> number of patients per pathologist in the UK and the United States. And here you have places there are no pathologists, one in, you know, one pathologist every five million and so forth. So what we take for granted is, uh, you know, clinicians, my, my colleagues, you know, we send the sample off, you know, biopsy taken and sent off. They get the answer back. That doesn't exist in sub-Saharan Africa. It's just not there. So we... One, so one <coughs> part of the equation is training and education, and I'm 100% behind that, but also sometimes coming up with creative solutions is also part of it. Um, just to give you a perspective, you know, how many steps that, uh, is involved to make one slide um, from the time the tissue biopsy is taken? 5, 10, 30, 50. Well, it turns out that it's around, uh, when you start, there's a, a whole bunch of steps. This is um, courtesy of my friend Mark Stoller at the University of Virginia. And when you get to the end, it's about 30 steps just to get one diagnosis. That's hard to do in places without laboratory infrastructure. So we've actually been looking at some alternative approaches to making diagnosis. For example, we can use a molecular marker, again, uh, basically antibodies against P16, and what we found is that um, this is a very robust marker um, that can be read uh, right now by a you know, sort of first year resident pathologist who basically is an untrained pathologist. We're actually going to look at see whether high school students can or you know, college students can do this with no, you know, no medical training, no pathology, no nothing. Um, when, we, when we looked at the performance of the community, versus the reviewers versus someone, as I said, who's just starting their pathology residence, um, we saw that the P16 worked on, is a little, little more sensitive, a little slightly less specific. But you know, as a first cut where essentially you don't need to know, be able to read morphologic changes, that's pretty good. And if we could get a high school student to do that, that might be one alternative. Another alternative, this is with um, um, a colleague at Rice University, was looking at sort of an in situ diagnostic approach. And this is uh, the, the prototype in which essentially this is um, what it's doing is this is the probe here, and it's actually looking as, at sub uh, uh, macroscopic levels or microscopic levels, looking at the, um, at the nuclei and looking at the distribution and size of the nuclei. And so here you have. Um, examples of um, low-grade disease, and this is what you might see. And then at high-grade disease, you see a much different sort of distribution and behavior of the nuclei. 
And so right now we're working on a grant to miniaturize it and make it work off a cell phone because having carting computers around everywhere is not really going to be much of an answer and at $2,500, you know, it's just too much and too likely to be broken. Mm -hmm. But everybody everywhere has cell phones. People in Africa have cell phones and they don't even have homes. So sometimes, <coughs> I mean, so the message here is it's a combination, training and education. I'm so important, I can't, we could spend a whole hour talking about that. But sometimes we also need to come up with technological uh, solutions as well. Um, and so I, I'm working on both of those. And the bigger picture, of course, is there's a greater emphasis on NCDs. And many of these places, uh, you know, some of this is lifestyle, but also many of this is just not having access to good, good care. And so the opportunity around cervix is to, to be a driver around <coughs> better, uh, better, uh, uh, better medicine and better health care uh, services. And I really, th I, I'll stop here. Um, I saw this in the um, New York Natural History Museum. It was, I was in some hall and I was there actually talking about viral genetics of all things. And I was struck by this because 50 years ago we put a uh, man on the moon, more than 50 years now, and we all benefited. Technology has advanced greatly. Um, I mean, I think we could probably point to our cell phones and say, this is what got that technological revolution. Well, I see cervix potentially being this role for health services delivery in, uh, in the global setting, that it could be the, the driver that leads to technological and social change to delivery. And I think it's mostly about willpower, at least in cervix, that we really could make a difference in my lifetime, certainly in your lifetimes, um, on uh, reducing the unnecessary burden of cervical cancer. And I'll stop there and take some questions. Thank you. Do we have questions for <coughs> Bill, please? Um, you mentioned the cell phone is one way to disseminate interventions for cervical cancer. Are there other methods that you see as being possible to broaden dissemination? Well, the, the cell phone was really the, the, the sort of the miniature computer yeah. in that particular case. I mean, I think certainly a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about telemedicine, telepathology. Um, it depends on the specifics. Like, in the world of pathology, there's one thing to set a picture where a pathologist is sitting, let's say, in Rwanda and says, I think this is breast cancer, and to get a confirmation from a pathologist in the United States. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that if you don't have a pathologist on that end and you have this piece of glass that may or may not have something on it, you have to scan the whole slide and send it. And that's a level of, of um, connectivity that doesn't isn't quite there yet. It's very hard to send full images, which are many megabytes, I think even gigabytes, of information and send it reliably back and forth. Now, that said, of course, a lot of diagnosis <coughs> doesn't have, have to happen in real time, but we need to work on s connectivity solutions so that we can, it, not only to provide diagnosis, but also to train. So to train people on how to read glass or to uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of um, uh, revolutionary ideas, and I think one of the things that um, you know I'm very interested in is, is really getting engineers excited about some of these problems. Like how do we how do we uh, compress data? How do we send data? How do we think outside the box that is really put a stranglehold on uh, in, um, communication, informatics, um, and things like that? Thank you. Other questions. Yes. Yes, I'm wondering if a uh, if a vaccinated um, individual is infected with a, a high risk HPV type and clears that type, is reinfection like possible, or is 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 there sort of some sort of a resistance after clear? It's a that's an excellent question, and not one that we have a good answer for. We fundamentally believe that there's some host memory um, to that type, but it's been really hard to quantify. Um, that, you know, what's an effective memory response, in part because I think that the, the typical infection is, um, it's localized, so you don't have, you don't have viremia, it's, it's all localized in a place that doesn't do a lot of immune surveillance. So 
you know, you don't have an organized lymphat lymphoid tissue like in the gut, you have the payer's patch. There's nothing like that in the cervix. So we've had a really hard time measuring that, you know, what's an effective immune <coughs> response and therefore would be an effective memory. Um, when we look at cohorts, we never have long enough time to follow them. We don't s tend to see people getting that same infection back, but you also have to realize that the um, none of those cohorts were really powered to look at that. It just because, of course, you have an aging cohort too, so their 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 behaviors that would lead to HPV acquisition are changing. Right. So it gets really complicated. You probably would need cohorts that are in the hundred thousands to really know to really know whether that from an epidemiologic standpoint. So I, the answer, the short answer is, I think so but I don't actually have proof. Now the other issue here, and there's been some recent data that's kind of shown this, is there's probably a latency too, right. which yeah. makes it even more complicated to decide, is that a new infection? Or is it something that's, that's uh, recrudescent that you know, tomorrow will go get back under immunologic control? And we're seeing this, this, this sort of blip on the radar around the time of, um, of menopause. So, and that's a whole other clinical issue because as we use HPV testing, how do we communicate that that may not be a clinically important infection? Right. So, you know, there's, you know, we take two steps back and then we take a step, I mean, two steps forward and then a step back in terms of improving it, but it's a complicated problem. Right. So I was just wondering that because you, you, you kind of dismissed catch-up vaccination in individuals older than 18. Right. But if we can go back after recovery to susceptible, well, then such a vaccination would, in fact, make sense. It? Well, it, it, look, the vaccine works in men and women and at all ages. There's no dispute. But the issue is not efficacy. Okay. And I want to emphasize, the issue is not efficacy. It's effectiveness. How many events are you preventing for that, those doses of vaccine? If it's up to me, it's just my opinion, it, you have a room full of women of all ages, and you have, you know, let's say you have 10,000, and you have a thousand doses of vaccine. Are you going to give it to the 18 year old, or are you going to give it to the to the thousand that are? Yeah, no, of course. you know, I mean, that, and those are the choices, and really, those are the choices we should be making here too, to some extent. I mean, there's the what's really cost effective and necessary versus the nice to have versus the stuff that there's no evidence that it helps populations. For example, there's no evidence that screening under 21 helps anybody and has some significant potential harms to it. Vaccinating women who are in their 20s is nice, but I don't think we should be paying for it. I think if you want to electively get vaccinated at the age of 25, I'm all for personal choice, but I don't want to pay for it. And I don't think a, a country with low, lower resources should ever pay for that. I mean, we're lucky to get try to get any program set up. We need to make it as cost effective as possible. So, it you know, absolutely, the vaccine will work at any ages, and a 70 year old who starts having new sexual partners, so it'll work. Now, I don't even know if that infection even has the potential of going on to getting cancer, though, because I think there's a hormonal component, we, as you and I have discussed, that is needed to drive the uh, HPV carcinogenesis. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, please. Are there, do you happen to know what the current cost is of the HPV vaccine or of the test? And are there programs in developing countries to help pay for those currently? So Gavi has listed HP, so Global Alliance for Vaccine Immunization um, has made HPV part of their portfolio this year. So it's under five or something like that. I don't remember the exact cost, but that is huge. Yeah. Huge. Because. Uh, uh, and I have the utmost admiration for Gavi. They've really stepped in and made a difference on access. Um, the the assays, um, carriage PV is going to be priced at five dollars. I don't know yet about the E6 test. I mean, carriage PV just got F, uh, SFD, Chinese FDA approval, which is important because that's where it's being manufactured. Um, we're also, I'm talking to the NCI about maybe trying to do a U.S. trial for self-collection because it, for those that have worked internationally, if you get FDA approval or CDC endorsement or WHO endorsement, it just it greases the axles in ways that you just there's no there's no argument. 
If you can point to a guideline or a regulatory body that says this works, it's your life is a whole lot easier. So I, we're making progress, but I, I still think there's a role for some super group or some organization to come in and make diagnostics available, and not just HPV. Um, there's lots of great lab tests that are sitting out there that are essentially not available to the rest of the world, just as vaccines weren't before Gavi came along. That if we just got them there and showed people how to use them, and now with automation, these things are not that hard to run. Many of them are very simple because you're paying for the automation. Mm -hmm. um, so we need tiered pricing and we need to, to make things available. So the, the HPV stuff is coming along. I'm also talking to a lot of the companies with the first world test to say, what can you do? How low can you go? Can you afford to sell this test for $1 profit to a Vietnam? Well, if the test only costs a dollar or so to run, you know, two dollars a test, you know, that's a, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that they would make. It's not very much per test, but they become, you know, you have to think in terms of global, global marketing. They become the HPV test or the, you know, the company that provides HPV testing. So a lot of these are, have nothing to do with science. <laughs> you know, it's about political will and, and negotiating um, uh, uh, access. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Steve, do you have a question? Uh, I know it's economic buying, Sky, but could you comment on the role of HPV as a risk factor for head and neck cancer on a global scale? Well, I don't think we know. And I, I mean, obviously, a lot of the head and neck stuff um, has been done in the United States, and there's some controversy as to the etiologic fraction of HPV in head and neck, but let's say it's half. Um, Obviously, where you're giving vaccination for anogenital cancers, you get that side benefit of vaccinating the population to prevent some head and neck. It's a little less clear to me how uh, uh, the relative importance of HPV is vis-a-vis -vis other factors for head and neck like alcohol and tobacco use. There doesn't, in my recollection, is there doesn't seem to be an interaction. You are, you know, you're in one camp or the other. Um, and there's no evidence, I, I think, that the, you know, so alcohol and tobacco increase the risk of an HPV induced. It's, you know, it's all sexual and you either have one or the other. Uh, you know, I think it's an, it's an add-on. Now, how to use it for screening is a whole other discussion, which is, pro you know, one worth having. My concern with head and neck is that we don't really have, um, well, half of the disease is not HPV related, so we need a marker for that. Um, and the other is we don't have a precancer state identified to really intervene upon, um, which is you know key for prevention. Now, whether it could be used for early detection or not has to do with the cost of the screening test and the, the performance of the screening test. And when you just take an oral lavage, I don't think the data supported that. So you actually have to get down there and sample. So whether people will be willing to do that or not, I mean it, it's. I'm, I'm shortcutting a longer conversation, and I apologize for that, because it is a longer conversation. It's a, it's a complicated <coughs> one. Um, you know, I, I think we have to do more, and I think there are studies coming to look at the relative importance of which can use for locally and head and neck, um, and that will be a little, provide a little more insight as to whether this is a, you know, sort of a Western phenomenon or a global phenomenon in terms of the contribution of HPV. Head and neck, and we'll need that to understand what we need to do going forward.